Picking up where we left off in chapter 11, we are now going to hear the story that Nokomis is telling the family. Nanabozho and Muskrat make an earth. Maywiza, Maywiza, long time ago. Rain started, more rain, as though it would never quit. The water rose so fast that our Nanabozho ran to the top of a hill. The water followed him. At the top of the hill, there was a pine tree. Nanabozho climbed the tree. Still, the water kept rising. He said to the tree, brother, stretch yourself. The tree stretched twice as long. He climbed some more, then asked the tree to stretch again. The tree stretched four times. That's how tall it was. Finally, the tree told Nanabozho that he couldn't do any more for him. That was as high as the tree could go. But then the water stopped. Nanabozho was standing at the top of the tree. He had his head back and the water was up to his mouth. After a while, Nanabozho noticed that there were animals playing in the water. Beaver, muskrat, and otter. Nanabozho spoke first to otter asking, brother, could you go down and get some earth? If you do that, I will make an earth for you and me to live on. Otter said to Nanabozho, I will try. Away he went down to the bottom of the water, but Otter didn't get halfway to the bottom. He drowned, then floated up to the top. Nanabozho caught hold of the Otter and looked into the Otter's paws and mouth, but didn't find any dirt. The Nanabozho blew on Otter and brought him back to life. Did you see anything, he asked. No, said Otter. The next animal Nanabozho spoke to was Beaver. He asked him to go after some earth down below and said, if you do, I'll make an earth for us to live on. Beaver said, I'll try and went down. Beaver was gone a long time. Pretty soon he floated to the top of the water. He had also drowned. Nanabozho caught hold of the beaver and blew on him. When Beaver came to, Nanabozho examined his paws and mouth to see if there was any dirt, but he couldn't find anything. Did you see any earth at the bottom? Nanabozho asked Beaver. Yes, I did, said the Beaver. I saw it, but I couldn't get any of it. These animals had tried and failed. Muskrat was also playing around in the water. Nanabozho didn't think much about the muskrat because he was so small, just a little animal, too weak. But after a while, he said to him, why don't you try and go after some of that dirt too? Muskrat said, I'll try, and he dived down. Nanabozho waited and waited a long time for muskrat to come up to the top of the water. When he floated up to the top, he was dead from his exertion. Nanabozho caught hold of Muskrat and looked him over. Muskrat had his paws closed up tight. His mouth was shut too. Nanabozho opened Muskrat's front paw and found a grain of earth in it, and he took it. In his other front paw, Nanabozho found another little grain and one grain of dirt in each of his hind paws. There was another grain in his mouth. When he'd found these five grains, Nanabozho blew on muskrat until he came back to life. Then Nanabozho took the grains of earth in the palm of his hand. He held them up to the sun to dry them out. When they were all dry, he threw them around onto the water. A little island rose. The four went on to the island. Nanabozho, otter, beaver, and muskrat. Nanabozho got more earth on the island and threw it all around. The island got bigger. It got larger every time Nanabozho threw out another handful of dirt. The animals at the bottom of the water, whoever was there, all came up to the top of the water and went to the island, this earth we are on today. 
Amakias knew that her Nokomis told her this story for a larger reason than just because she asked for it. She thought many times of the muskrat diving down, down, down for that little bit of dirt that made the world. She imagined muskrat finally pulling to the very bottom and grasping that bit of earth in its tiny paws. If such a small animal could do so much, Nokomis always said after she'd finished the story, your efforts are important too. As if he had understood grandma's story, Andeg made his own effort. Her crow hunted mice these lean days with more savage intentions than when merely keeping them away from his family of humans. He hunted for survival. The bird eagerly awaited any mouse who dared enter the house. Hungrily, Andeg dropped and struck hard, killing the little animal and quickly eating it. Andeg also hunted in the woods for seeds and nuts cached by squirrels. That winter, Andeg found a little hollow in a tree next to the cabin. Some squirrel had filled the hollow with acorns, seeds, hazelnuts, enough to feed the family for a day or two. Neshki said mama, her hands full one morning. Look what that good bird found for us. Andeg was looking at the food cache as though he wasn't quite sure he'd meant to share, but Mama was pleased. She scattered a big load of acorns on the hearth stones and looked at them with satisfaction before she began to break the little shells with her smoothest pounding rock. She shelled the acorns, ground them fine, roasted them with a bit of cornmeal, and that night the family had sweet acorn cakes. From the last cone of maple sugar, she made a taste of syrup for them all. And that night at least, they went to sleep with a comfortable warmth in their stomachs. All of them before sleeping thanked Andeg, who, though he usually slept outside, was invited in that night. He sat above the fire on a thick twig perch Dede had fastened between the mortared stones. Andeg preened his feathers, very glad to be so warm, bobbed his sleek head, and blinked his brilliant eyes. Tomorrow, resolved Omakias, now that she had a bit of strength, she would make her small, important effort like the muskrat. She would go out with Andeg and find more squirrel caches in the woods. She didn't reckon on her own weakness, however, nor could she ever have imagined the swiftness of old Tallow's justice. The day dawned pure and cold. Nokomis and Mama mixed up some water with the thin paste of acorn flour left from the night before. Dede came in with a fish so tiny and poor looking that in spite of their hunger, everyone laughed out loud when he lifted it proudly into the air. Everyone that is except Mama. She just rested her eyes a little more softly on her husband than usual and went on with her beadwork. Amakias, ready to do her part, dressed in her warmest clothes, wrapped lengths of rabbit skin around her feet, put moccasins over them, and then Andeg on her shoulder went to look for the squirrel cases. Although she had finished with Nokomis, this was the first time Amakias had ventured into the woods since the day she had entered the cabin. On that day, she had followed the sickness inside and determined to do battle with the evil spirit of the disease. She had lost her beloved Niwo. Now she decided that she would not lose any of her family to the weakness of hunger. She would find food somewhere. Dizziness overcame her. Her knees felt watery and her blood ran thin. She paused holding on to a tree and made her way toward the woods beyond. First, she had to pass Old Tallow's place and she narrowed her eyes at the path and stepped forward with determined quickness, prepared not to stop until Andeg told her where to find more nuts and acorns. She didn't reckon on the yellow dog. He was there in her path as she neared Old Tallow's cabin. She wouldn't look at him, she decided, but she couldn't help remembering the words his look had given her last summer. Wait until next time. I'll get you then. I'll get you when no one is around. 
what could he do to her? Even in her weakness, she would be mentally stronger. She would show him no fear. But as though he sensed the truth of her condition and not the determined pluck of her heart, the yellow dog stepped forward. As always, he snarled and then retreated when Omakias grabbed a stick. When she brandished the stick, however, a spinning haze of brilliant dots flooded up before her eyes. Suddenly, it was as though she stepped over the edge of a black cliff. She stumbled, fainted to the ground. The yellow dog lunged forward. Andeg screamed and tore with his beak at the dog's eyes, but the dog was eager at last to get the better of a human. As the clumsiest hunting dog of old Tallow's pack, he needed to stand tall over something, even if only a sick little girl. Amakios groped for her stick, but suddenly the yellow dog had it in its teeth. He growled, worried the stick as though he'd caught a gopher, then dropped it and with an eager bite tore into the blanket that fell from her arm. With a vicious lunge, he bit Omakias above the wrist and jumped back, eyes blazing with cowardly triumph. Omakias tried to yell, but her voice stuck in her throat, a squeak. She felt a rushing blackness overwhelm her again, tried to throw herself upward, tried to growl back and challenge the dog. With excitement, though, the dog realized he had her at his mercy at last. He jumped forward again. This time, he fell upon her leg and bit deep. Amakias heard a loud scream, her own scream, and pain blotted her sight then as she swirled into the dark. She woke a moment later in old Tello's arms. What happened? Nearby, the yellow dog cringed and tried to slink away from Old Tallow's glare. Seeing that Omakias was all right, Old Tallow carefully put the girl down. With a swift, bear-like swipe, she grabbed the dog and held him by the scruff of the neck with one hand. He whimpered and snarled at Omakias as though to say, she made me do it. Old Tallow shook her head, sadly and lifted her axe, ignoring Omakias, who panted weakly on the snowy ground, Old Tallow spoke to her dog as she would to a human. Sadly and firmly, holding him by the neck, she told the dog what he had done. Didn't I warn you? Didn't I say to you? Didn't I tell you many times that you must never hurt this one? Yes, Ndai. You look at me now with pleading eyes, but I spared you many times before. Each time I spared your life, I always told you what would happen if you were so foolish again. Now, my foolish friend, you must die. With that, Old Tallow brought the blunt end of her axe down on the yellow dog's head. He crumpled to the ground. I, my auntie. The yellow dog had hated her, perhaps even meant to kill her, but Omakias hadn't counted on such a cruel and sudden end to the dog's cowardly life. Old Tallow's justice was harsh. Her sentence was carried out in an instant, but that didn't mean that her heart was hard or that she didn't mourn for her friend. It just meant that Omakias was more important. The last that Amakia saw of the yellow dog, he was bundled in old Tallow's arms. The strong old woman was walking away, and in her step there was the sadness of parting with an old but dangerously foolish friend. Amakia got slowly to her feet, wobbled forward, and knew that she would have to return to the cabin. She still wasn't strong enough to hunt for food. With Andeg's encouragement, she made it back to the door and fell through, her vision darkening. Her stomach creaked so empty it stuck to the back of her body. She needed Grandma's help to dress the bites that throbbed and stung. They must have food. They must have food. Soon they must eat, she knew, or they would all lie in the ground with the two who had gone before. 
It was the great buck one horn who saved them, who gave them his life. Grandma woke two mornings later and called Day Day to her side to talk, for she was so weak from hunger, she could only sit wrapped in her blanket by the fire. I dreamed last night, she told him, and now you must do everything just as I say. Day Day listened intently. Take the small path to the north that leads past the fish camp, said Grandma, gesturing slowly. She squinted, looked deeper into her dream, nodded slowly. When you come to the tallest of the trees, go toward the lake, then around the rocks and back into the trees. There, the buck will wait for you. Day Day knew when Grandma dreamed, especially in this extremity, it was a true dream and must be followed. First, however, he prepared himself carefully to meet the animal's spirit. He washed, put on his best clothing, new moccasins, and had Mama comb and braid his hair. He cleaned and oiled his new gun and prepared it with extra care. Then he went immediately out and followed Grandma's directions exactly. Just as she had said, in the clearing past the rocks and back in the trees, one horn was waiting. The great buck stood still in the calm light. Dede lifted his gun, breathed his hopes, then thanks. One shot. The shot went true. One horn died easily right then. Dede gave tobacco to the deer's spirit and thanked him, brought back as much as he could carry, then buried the rest of the deer in snow. Returning, he gave the venison to his starving family and to Tallow, who shared it out to Auntie Muskrat, to Lepatre's hungry children, and to Fishtail. That night, as Omakias ate the stew of venison that Mama cooked, she felt herself grow stronger with each bite. She remembered the day she and Angeline stood before the beauty of one horn. They had looked on him amazed and he did not run away. Had he known at that time that they would need his very existence? Again, Omakias remembered the proud, soft radiance of his brown eyes. She closed her eyes and saw one horn feasted, honored, and decorated with her grandmother's finest beadwork. Opening her eyes again, she thanked the animal for saving her life. And then, just as she finished thinking this solemn thought, Pinch, whose belly was full, backed up too close to the hearth and set the seat of his pants on fire. Mama! He jumped away, a little flame shooting from his rear. In sudden inspiration, he sat down directly in the water bucket. Everybody looked at him at first in shock, and then once he was seen to have suffered no harm, it was Mama, first of all, who started to laugh. And Pinch laughed too. Laughed so hard that he wedged his behind farther into the bucket and could not get out. Laughed and laughed harder and harder. Ever after that terrible winter, as though he understood from then on how important it was to be funny, Pinch gave laughter to them all. He became a joker, a trick player, and joked on himself as well as others. Perhaps it was that first saving laugh, the best thing any of them had heard since before the death of Nemo, that made him proud. He had saved his family in a way every bit as much as one horn. The great deer had saved their bodies, and Pinch's absurd jump had saved their souls. For Nokomis said shortly after that her own grandmother had believed that the soul of the Anishinaabeg is made of laughter. If there is no laughter, the soul dies. Pinch brought laughter back to life. He brought their souls back into their bodies. The harder they laughed, the more they knew now they would survive. <laughs>